A century ago, before the advent of paved roads and highways, western Maryland's Frederick and Washington counties were connected by a small and somewhat unique local rail line. The Hagerstown and Frederick Railway, best known for its interurban trolley cars, was an electric railway that transported passengers and freight between Hagerstown, Frederick, Thurmont, and other area communities from the 1890s into the 1950s. It connected rural farms and small industries with the B&O Railroad and Pennsylvania Railroad in Frederick. Eventually, the automobile killed the trolleys, and trucks made the small freight trains obsolete. In 1954, the last trolley finished its service between Thermont and Frederick, and not long after, the tracks were removed, but they're not forgotten. Fragments of the H&F still exist, from buildings to bridge abutments to grade mounds upon which the track had rested. The evidence of the small railway's influence in this area still exists. Join us now as we take a digital journey along the H&F, flying above the places the trolley once traveled, thanks to Google Earth, and visiting old memories of another era. Join us in tracing the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway. We begin our journey at the Carroll Street Terminal in Frederick. Originally serving the Frederick Railroad Company, it served as the headquarters of the Hagerstown and Frederick for many years, and even after the trolley service ended, was the offices of the Potomac Edison Company, the local electric company which the H&F became. More recently, it was known as the Frederick News Post Building. As of 2015, plans exist to preserve part of the facade as part of a new convention center to be constructed on the site. Mainline-bound trolleys would depart from Carroll Street, as we're doing here. They would turn from the center of the street, one to Patrick Street to head west. Passing through downtown Frederick, the trolley then turns on to Jefferson Street and travels a short distance before turning once again, this time onto what is now called Braddock Avenue. Crossing what was then farmland and wilderness, the line followed Butterfly Lane and wound its way up the side of the mountain, crossing bridges where dips were sharp and going through deep cuts where the hills were too high. In total, the trolley climbed a height of 600 feet to the top, a steep climb for any railroad. At the top of the mountain, we come to Braddock Heights. This community had two stations and a heavy investment by the company. On the main line, we stop at Braddock Junction. This small shelter served the community itself, as well as the Hotel Braddock, a resort hotel that the H&F provided financial assistance to construct. The hotel was based on those along the boardwalks of the eastern shore and was built in 1905. The 70-room hotel was open until a fire destroyed it only two months before the stock market crash of 1929. Braddock Heights had become one of the area's first tourist destinations. The fresh breeze was refreshing in the summer, in a time when most of the trees had been harvested from the mountain. People from Washington and Baltimore would take the B&O or the Western Maryland, and then hop on a trolley at Frederick to spend their summer weekend relaxing here. From Braddock Junction, one could walk or take a trolley car along the mountaintop. Trains from Frederick would stop just past the station and then change directions, traveling along Maryland Avenue to this store, which was the gateway to the railway's own mountaintop amusement park. Attractions included a roller rink and game hall, complete with bowling lanes, an indoor carousel, a theater, dance hall, observation tower, and a giant slide. Over the years, a Ferris wheel, pony rides, miniature train ride, and other attractions were added. Called the Grove of the Golden Stars, the company also dedicated 93 Norway maple trees at the park, each in honor of a serviceman from the area who had died in World War I. Trolley service to the park ended in 1947. From the park, trolleys could continue down Jefferson Boulevard, along the top of the mountain for several miles. Over the years, the road alongside would become populated by summer cottages for those wanting to escape the cities. Today, most of these are permanent residences, making this trolley-funded resort into a cozy community. The trolleys also served Vindabona, at one time another classy hotel, and then began its descent down the mountain into Jefferson. At Jefferson, this branch line dead-ended at this small station. Although the station provided a way for Jeffersonians to quickly travel to the city and local farmers to ship their goods, the original plan for this line had been to continue south and join the B&O Railroad's busy rail yard at Brunswick. The town of Brunswick itself paid to install tracks down the center of its main street. However, the trolley line was never constructed between these two communities. Today, the Jefferson Station can still be seen from Jefferson Pike. It's used by the local co-op for storage, and the former waiting room serves as a small country novelties and artist shop. 
We return now to our trip down the main line at Braddock Junction, where our trolley will begin its descent down the western side of the hill towards Middletown. Crossing the old National Pike at the top, it turns and follows the road at a steady descent. While many Frederick trains were started by the Frederick Railway Company, and at one point some Braddock Heights trains were run by the Frederick and Braddock Heights Railway, the original mountain crossing destination was to connect the farming community of Middletown with Frederick to transport grains and produce quickly to market. It was here that the original fundraising began. Entering Middletown, we passed from the old National Pike through what locals would recognize as the Ingalls Lumber property. The freight house that once allowed H&F trains to enter still stands as part of the primary structure. This is likely the place that the original line was meant to end, as there was at one point a grain silo and other freight-based companies on the property as well. The H&F would have served all of these. Passing behind that building, the trolley blazed the trail for what is today Green Street, and stopped at this, the Middletown Station. An interesting mix of train shed and traditional station, trolleys could enter through the side of the building if needed, and freight and express items could be loaded from the platform out front. Today, a Chinese restaurant stands in its place. From Middletown, the line still would be a scenic ride through hilly farmland today. Very little remains here, as the land is actively worked. Nearing the Myersville area, the line passes through what is known as Rudy's Hollow. At one time, this was a popular place for photographers to stop and snap a passing trolley car. Crossing Catoctin Creek, where the H&F bridge posts can but still be seen alongside Route 17, we climb the hill and approach Myersville. This community was the end of the line after 1938, when tracks over the mountain were removed due to the lack of passengers and the construction of what is now Route 40, the Baltimore National Pike. This station, which served Myersville passengers and doubled as a store, eventually gained a second floor and today is an apartment building. From Myersville, we begin our journey west over the pre-1938 route. Despite being gone for over 75 years, many places where these tracks once traveled are still clearly evident crossing the mountain. We pass the current site of Car 150, a 1918 car bought secondhand by the H&F, which often served the hagerstown Boonesboro branch line. Descending down a small hill, the grade here is very evident from the National Pike. Nearing the top of the mountain, the tracks parallel Canada Hill Road and wind their way up to the highest point in the line. Our trolley car has risen over 900 feet in altitude compared to where we were in Frederick. The line carefully winds its way down the side of the mountain, weaving with the terrain. One of the few, and no doubt most bizarre, mountain derailments that the H&F ever had was in this area, where the motorman of car 35 lost control on iced over rails in 1936. Although the motorman himself jumped to safety, the one passenger, another H&F employee, perished when the car smashed to the ground as he was retrieving his luggage. The wheels of the trolley car, however, continued to the bottom of a mountain, surprising passengers waiting at Mount Lannis Station, seen here as a rough model. The ill-fated Car 35 is stopped beside the station on our map. The Mount Lana trolley station was replaced by a more modern electrical substation nearby. The abandoned structure eventually collapsed into itself. From here the line is very evident until it reaches Route 40 again. Passing the modern-day Mason-Dixon Dragway and Boonesboro Family Recreation Park, passing the new substation, it begins its climb up a small hill. We reach Wagner's Crossroads on the other side of the hill, now considered a portion of Beaver Creek. It is here that the Boonesboro branch travels down Route 66 towards its namesake community. We will revisit this line later. After passing through Beaver Creek itself, we cross through the auto dealerships along Dual Highway. We enter Funkstown. There was a small park here where the trolley from Hagerstown originally dead-ended. The tracks crossed this stone bridge, which is still in use by automobiles, and continued up the old National Pike, before turning onto Wilson Boulevard. The entire stretch of grass divider in this street was used as the track space for the H&F. For our trip, we leave Wilson Boulevard at Pope Avenue, before turning onto Potomac Street in Hagerstown. And finally, our trip from Frederick to Hagerstown is complete, ending at the town square. Excluding our detour to Jefferson, the trip has taken our passengers two hours. Imagine, if you will, that this single-track route was also shared by freight trains led by one of several different styles of small electric locomotive. 
Along the line, there would be short passing tracks at strategic points to allow the trains to pass each other. Within the H&F network, there were several branch lines which served individual communities over the years. The first we will visit is the Shady Grove branch. Traveling one track shared by the Hagerstown Loop trains, which, suggested by their name, looped around the city, allowing residents to quickly reach the stores of downtown or enjoy events at the Hagerstown fairgrounds. The trolleys left Potomac Street at Hamilton Boulevard. and passed through today's Long Meadow Shopping Center. They eventually followed Marsh Pike to the town of Reed. From Reed, the tracks veered west through farmland, and eventually ended at Buchanan Trail Road in the small town of Shady Grove, Pennsylvania. Instead of going to the nearby city of Greencastle, H&F Trolley stopped here at a small station store where passengers could transfer to the Chambersburg, Greencastle, and Waynesboro Railway, another trolley service between those three cities. The H&F eventually bought the CG&W. However, they could not share trains between the two lines because they were different gauge rail. Returning to Hagerstown, the next branch line we will travel is the Williamsport branch. Williamsport, though seen as a small community today, was impressive being only one-tenth the size of the city of Hagerstown nearby at the time and served as a coal interchange with the CNO Canal until the 1920s, though that service was primarily provided by the Western Maryland Railway. Most H&F service along this line was strictly passenger. Traveling from the square down Washington Street, our trolley turned onto Summit Avenue at the courthouse, and past the B&O rail yards and passenger station, which were located where the Gazette newspaper now stands. At the intersection of Summit and Lee Streets, we paused to look at the H&F car barn and Hagerstown substation. This large structure was originally built in the late 1890s as the Hagerstown Railway's power plant, and in 1917 was converted into a car barn with several tracks inside for storing and maintaining the trolleys that served the city. When Potomac Edison began operating their Blue Ridge Bus Company, as well as the trolleys, they also used this building as their garage. The building was expanded, and the large corner door on the expansion allowed the trolleys to continue to enter the building until service was ended. Back on our trip to Williamsport, the car continues down the center of Summit Avenue, crossing over the B&O tracks near Park Circle and the City Park. At this spot, Summit and Howard Streets, the original wooden car barn stood until a fire in March of 1917 destroyed it and all of the wooden trolley cars inside. At Wilson Boulevard, the car turns west, just for a moment, before turning south again onto Virginia Avenue. We pass through the town of Halfway. Now considered a part of Hagerstown, it was once halfway between Hagerstown and Williamsport. Here the line crossed the Pennsylvania Railroad's Cumberland Valley Railroad, now operated by Winchester and Western. Just past the point that Interstate 70 now crosses of Virginia Avenue, there was one of two passing tracks along this line. And finally, after a slight turn, the trolleys completed their run in the center of East Potomac Street, at Conakacheek Street. Not far from that point, near the CNO Canal, this small brick structure was the Hagerstown Railway's first powerhouse, constructed in 1896. Using water power from the nearby Conakajig Creek, it was hardly enough for the quickly growing trolley network, and was soon replaced by the Lee Street plant only a couple of years later. Returning to Hagerstown Square, we will begin our trip back east by taking car 150 to Boonesboro. Our car travels much the same route as we had taken coming into Hagerstown. As we pass through the original community of Beaver Creek, you will notice that the track veers south briefly. When the line was first constructed, the owner of the nearby mill refused to allow the railway to cross his properties. For this reason, the tracks had to go around the town instead of through it. Back at Wagner's Crossroads, we see 150 here, leaving the main line and turning alongside present-day Route 66, Mapleville Road. Immediately, we cross Route 40 and pass the Boonesboro Sheets, and continue following Mapleville Road. through the small village of Mapleville. Eventually, we once again meet the old National Pike, Route 40 alternate, and turn after crossing it. Here, you can still see the sidewalk is set back from the road, the tracks once traveled between them. Finally, we reach the end of the branch line, at this small station, now a museum near Schaefer Park in Boonesboro. After we make the return journey on the main line from Hagerstown, you'll find that we're back at the Carroll Street Terminal in Frederick. While the main line trains departed from Carroll Street itself, Thermont-bound trains departed from the opposite side of the building. At one point, trolley cars could also pass into the building itself, but that was later changed. Like the main line, and unlike the inner-city trips, 
The Thermont line was served by interurban combine cars, with a baggage and express store at one end, instead of coach or city cars which only provided seats. To compare, the Myersville trolley car 150, shown here, is a coach car, and this small loop car was a single truck city car. However, this car, number 168, which is preserved in the parking lot of the Hagerstown Roundhouse Museum, is an interurban combine car, sometimes just called combines. Today the train departing the terminal is a special, a private chartered trip using car 153. Pulling away from the terminal in Patrick Street, we travel down the center of that road, and eventually come to the Frederick Car Barn. Most of the trolleys would stop here for inspection and any repairs needed between runs before returning to the terminal to load passengers. Today the building has been incorporated into the modern Potomac Edison office building and supply depot. Shown here with a few off-duty combines, are three of the H&F's freight motors. These small engines in particular shuffle freight cars around the city of Frederick to and from industries and interchanging with other railroads. From here we travel up to 5th Street. Continuing down Patrick Street, we could follow the loop around the Frederick Fairgrounds and then travel on to 5th Street. We cross the Pennsylvania Railroad's Hanover, Frederick, and York Railway tracks on East Street. While all of the H&F tracks are gone, the PRR tracks remain in East and 5th Street here. For a time, the H&F paid to use the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks when their own tracks had been removed near the end of its service. On 5th Street, we cross North Market Street, where we could loop back downtown to return to the Carroll Street Terminal. But to go to Thermont, we will continue on 5th Street. And when 5th Street ends, we continue. The H&F crossed right through the campus of Hood College, and many students arrived at school each year on a trolley car. Crossing Rosemont Avenue, another gap between the sidewalk and the road, makes the trolley line presence visible once again. And after a short distance, we're traveling alongside Fort Dietrich. The fort had its own railroad yard and switcher engine, and the H&F carried freight between the fort and the other railroads. During the war, the fort was home to a scrap metal recycling facility, and trains of scrap metal for the fort were frequent on the H&F. Soon, once again, we are in farmland, and much of the line from here on out is scenic vistas. Occasionally, the remains of bridges and culverts still stand in the middle of farm fields. When the H&F originally crossed Route 15, the highway was a single lane dirt road. Rare collisions between trucks and trolleys did happen at this point, just before our stop in Lewistown. The line passed through Catoctin Furnace, and directly in front of the community's namesake industry. The original Thermont route had been the Monocacy Valley Railroad, a four-mile steam railroad connecting the Revolutionary War-era iron furnaces at Catoctin Furnace, which at the time were about to close, with the Western Maryland Railway at Thermont. As we approach Thermont, a portion of the h &F line has been converted into a walking trail with historical information about the line along its path. At Main Street in Thermont, we find interurban car 171 departing the H&F station, heading back towards Frederick. Although the station is gone today, the power substation attached to it still stands, painted with murals of the town's history. On the site of the station itself, H&F freight motor number 5 is preserved as a monument, having recently been restored by the town. Just a short distance further, we come to the final destination of the H&F, Thermont's Western Maryland Railway Station. It was here that Frederick passengers could grab a Western Maryland passenger train west or east. Frederick and other area mail was loaded onto or taken off of Western Maryland mail cars, and freight from all across Frederick County was added to Western Maryland trains to be taken on towards its final destination. It was also at this spot in February of 1954 that a large crowd gathered for speeches and interviews documented by radio broadcasters and photographers to bid farewell to the trolley. The last combine cars in Maryland departed Thermont that day, and an era ended. Today we can only look back and appreciate the H&F for what it was. Compared to modern transportation, it wasn't the fastest, the most efficient, or the most comfortable way to travel. But in its heyday, the H&F was the fastest, and the most efficient, and the most comfortable. And it was influential and an enjoyable part of daily life for those who fondly remember it.